About 2,800 years ago, a long period of Greek cultural isolation came to an end when a seafaring people that we call the Phoenicians came looking for people to trade with and found eager partners in the Greeks. Ever since, Hellenic culture has absorbed influences from abroad through intermediaries traveling on both land and sea. I'm interested in the way that the early Greeks wove this newly acquired knowledge of distant lands and peoples into their mythology. One kind of myth that they like to tell touching on this theme involved what we might call self-colonization. These were stories set in the legendary past about foreigners who were born elsewhere, who came to Greece to rule or exercise power and yet were actually of Greek descent. The myth of Jason and Medea furnishes a good example of this. Jason was a prince from Iolcus who sailed from Greece to the kingdom of Colchis at the far end of the Black Sea in search of the Golden Fleece. In the oldest version of the story, and this is before Euripides' play, the Medea, Jason was a magician who acquired the fleece using his arts. He also used those arts to seduce the Colchian princess Medea, a fellow magician, and the two fell in love. When they returned home, they settled in the city of Corinth. He and Medea were chosen to rule there, and Medea was honored by the Corinthians after her death. Now, if you're puzzled why the Corinthians would accept a foreign woman as their queen, the answer lies in her ancestry. Her father, Aetes, was the son of the man who founded Corinth. A generation earlier, Aetes had left home, yielding to his brother, in order to become the king of Colchis. Thus, he and his daughter were both foreigners, yet also of Greek descent. So through this story, the early histories of Colchis and of Corinth were woven together. Or take another legend, uh, that of Io. Io came from Argos, where she was the daughter of the local river god, Inachus. The myths say that she was raped by the god Zeus and that Zeus's wife Hera had her turned into a creature who was half woman and half cow and then driven mad by a stinging gadfly. To avoid the insect, she wandered in a panic over the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean, which you can see on this little map here, until eventually she settled in Egypt. There she gave birth to her son by Zeus, who was called Epaphus. And Epaphus has several descendants, including the aboriginal kings of Arabia, of Phoenicia, and of Egypt. Among his great-grandsons were two brothers, Egyptus and Danaeus. Uh, Egyptus had 50 sons and Danaeus 50 daughters. The 50 sons of Egyptus were to be married off to Danaeus's daughters, but the brides objected and murdered their husbands on the wedding night. With their father, they sailed away from Egypt looking for a place that would take them in. The city that provided them with asylum was Argos, the place where Io was born five generations earlier. The Argives handed Danaos the king's keys to the kingdom, and he ruled over much of southern Greece. Once again, while he came from a Hellenic family, he was Egyptian by birth. In fact, he was the brother of the very man who gave Egypt its name. A third variation on this theme involves a god, Dionysus. Dionysus was the son of Zeus and Semele, a princess from the city of Thebes. In this story, Zeus lusted after Semele, raped and impregnated her. Hera discovered this and tricked Semele into asking Zeus that he reveal himself to her in all his might. So Zeus, who had sworn to do whatever she wanted, fulfilled her request. And the result of this revelation was that Semele was burned to death in the face of the God's power. So Zeus rescued the divine fetus and oddly enough, became a mother to it, stitching it into his thigh, which you can see on this picture here. After Zeus was born, Zeus had him raised in secret. The place where he was born and raised was in Africa. Um, oops, how do we go back? There we go. The particular part of Africa was what the Greeks called Ethiopia, 
In this talk, I'm going to use that pronunciation to distinguish it from modern Ethiopia, although the words are obviously related to one another. The territory of Ethiopia corresponds roughly to the modern country of Sudan, and the people call themselves the Kush. In later antiquity, the land went by the name of Nubia. Anyway, Dionysus grows up in Ethiopia and invents wine there. A king named Lycurgus drives him away and he wanders throughout Asia. After surmounting various obstacles, he comes back to Greece, introduces the cultivation of wine at Thebes, his mother's native city, and is recognized as an Olympian god, a full member of the Greek pantheon. According to this early myth then, Dionysus was born in Africa. His Af uh, Ethiopian roots and Egyptian character traits are the subject of my talk today. And there are two main reasons why I wanted to share this with you. Uh, one is to set the record straight. So standard reference works like the Oxford Classical Dictionary, they don't mention this connection at all. The main reason I think is that the two Athenian playwrights from the classical era, Aeschylus and Euripides uh, did not mention it in their plays. Instead, they represent Dionysus coming to Greece from Thrace in Aeschylus's uh, play or in, uh, from Lydia in Euripides case. However, neither playwright said or even implied that Dionysus was born in Thrace or in Lydia. And so the story of Dionysus's African birthplace is not contradicted by them, merely left unsaid. And there were also a few not, uh, Greek communities that claimed Dionysus as a native son. Yet early non-Athenian literary sources, including Homer, including Anacreon and Herodotus, they all agree that Dionysus, unique among the Olympian gods, was born in Africa. It's that tradition that I'd like to highlight here, presenting the textual and the archeological evidence for it and identifying the various persons who are instrumental in connecting the Greeks to the people of the Nile Valley. The second thing I would like to do is to raise some larger questions whose answers I, I certainly wouldn't claim to possess. If Dionysus' father was a god and his mother was Greek and he was born in Ethiopia, then what does that say about his cultural identity? Were the Greeks paying homage to foreign nations? Were they rec recklessly appropriating their traditions or neither of those things or both of them? Is this an early instance of Orientalism, of the fetishization of things non-European? Or is it some kind of reverse Orientalism? What in short is going on with this? I'm sure you'll have some thoughts and questions of your own that we can talk about later, but for now, I just wanna lay out the specific evidence for Dionysus's African connections. Most of it is very early, but some of it's late, and that late material will give me a chance to broaden the scope of our talk and um, look at some broader patterns and make some bigger conclusions. But first, let's start with the text. So recently, I've been doing research on the chronology of early Greek poetry, and I believe that this right here is the first or second oldest text that speaks about the birth of Dionysus. So people call this poem the Homeric Hymn to Dionysus, although we do not know if a man named Homer actually composed it. The hymn was at one time the first in a collection of long narrative poems addressed to Aphrodite, Demeter, Apollo, and Hermes. It's a great pity, however, that this particular hymn was not preserved completely. When it was copied by scribes in Byzantium, about 20 pages got left out. So all we have are some lines from the beginning and the end. This is the beginning part. So this is addressing Dionysus. Some say you were born at Draconon, some on windy Icarus, some on Naxos, divine child Eraphiota. It's a mysterious name, we don't know what it means. Some say at the deep whirling river Alpheus, some say that at Thebes, Lord, you were born, all lying. The father of men and gods bore you far from men, hiding you from white armed Hera. There is a certain Nysa, a way high mountain, florid with forest, far from Phoenicia, near the streams of the Nile. There, no mortal human crosses in a ship, for there is no harbor, no hold for curved ships, but a steep rock runs around it on every side, high 
and grows many fine and satisfying plants. And there the, our fragment cuts off. Regarding Mount Nysa, modern scholars say that its location is debated and, and or that it's an imaginary mountain, part of some never never land. I do not think that this is the case. Nysa denotes a specific mountain in Ethiopia. And to prove that this is the case, I'm gonna to touch on a bit of history now involving the Greeks the Egyptians and the Kush. So <clears throat> the latter two kingdoms lie next to each other along the Nile River, <clears throat> and they lived for thousands of years in a relationship that was by turns peaceful and hostile. During the, the excuse me, during the late 700s and the early 600s BCE, the Kushite kingdom was so strong <coughs> that it effectively absorbed Egypt, while the Kushite kings became the pharaohs. So rulers like Pa and Shabaka and Taharka, they had made up what is now called the 26th dynasty of Egypt. Kushite rule might have lasted for a very long time, but around the year 675, the mighty Assyrian empire invaded drove the Kushite rulers out and broke Egypt into dozens of mini kingdoms, each with its own prince. One of these princes, a man named Semeticus, then took an unusual step. He invited foreign mercenaries to aid him in a rebellion against Assyrian control. Some of these mercenaries came from Caria, some from ancient Israel, but most of them were Greek. When the rebellion succeeded, Semeticus, who is now Pharaoh, gave the Greeks a place to live inside the Nile Delta. From that point onward, we start to find Egyptian artifacts at sites all over Greece, especially in temples where Greek mercenaries would make dedications to the gods after returning safely home. This image of Naeth from the island of Samos is just one of hundreds found there. Conversely, we also start to find large amounts of Greek pottery in Egypt which is evidence that traders and civilians were joining the soldiers there. The pharaohs that followed Semeticus hired tens of thousands of Greek mercenaries and even commissioned Greek craftsmen to expand the Egyptian navy. The goal was to push back Egypt's enemies, including Assyria to the north and the Kush to the south. So let's now flash forward a few decades to the year 593 BCE. There's another pharaoh on the throne now, one named Semeticus II. Semeticus decides to invade the land of the Kush with the goal of moving the border between their kingdoms further south. And to do that, he assembles an army that's half Egyptian and half Greek and marches south along the Nile River. This journey is documented in Egyptian and Greek sources alike. It took all the months of the summer of 593 and stretched into the early fall. And along the way, the army left traces of its presence. At Abu Simbel, near the Kushite border, for example, mercenaries carved their names on the leg of the colossal statue of Ramses II. A few of the inscriptions are in Hebrew. Most of them are in Greek. One reads, when King Semeticus came to Elephantine, which is a town near Abu Simbel. This was written by those who sailed with Semeticus, the son of Theocles. This is a different Semeticus. And they came beyond Kirkus as far as the river permits. Those who spoke foreign tongues were led by Plotasimto, the Egyptians by Amasis. So that's a in graffiti written in Greek by a Greek. Advancing south of Abu Simbel, they soon fought a pitched battle with the Kushite army and won decisively. They took 4,200 prisoners of war. So we don't know the size of this invading army, but it must have been on the order of five or 10,000. The land of Kush at this point apparently left lay undefended uh, because the invaders passed right through three different important Kushite political and holy sites and ransacked them. So the image you see here shows in the upper right-hand corner, statues of the Kushite kings from the capital city of Napata, which is shown on the map here, just below the fourth cataract. 
The statues look impressive now, but when they were uncovered by archaeologists, they were broken and scattered about in a destruction layer surrounded by burnt timbers and charcoal. And this destruction coincides exactly in time with Semeticus's invasion. After wrecking havoc and advancing as far as the site of Kyrgyz, which is near the, the fifth cataract, this Greco-Egyptian force turned back and went home. The Kush built a new capital a few hundred miles south at Meroe. Pharaoh Semeticus died a few years later. As for the Greeks, they had traveled 1,200 miles from the Aegean, and it's a fair bet that never before had so many Greek persons ever traveled so far away from home, ever. The stories that they had to tell when they came back must have been pretty unbelievable. Let's now focus on one of the three sites that were sacked, a temple at the base of a mountain that is now known as Jebel Barkal. That's the name of the mountain. This mountain was believed to be the dwelling place of Amun or Amon, a supreme god whom the Greeks identified with Zeus. It was the most sacred site in Kush and of enormous political importance since it was a place where the Kushite kings were chosen and crowned sort of like a kind of a Vatican place for the Kushite kings. The capital city of Napata lay just across the river. When the river, there was a succession event, Amun would announce who the next king would be through an oracle. Now, the king, the Kushite king, was not Amun's son, but he was seen as a god. In life, he was assimilated with the god Horus, who the Greeks identified with Apollo, and in death, the king was assimilated to Osiris. Osiris was the Egyptian and the Kushite god of the underworld, and the Greeks identified him with Dionysus. Thus, in Greek eyes, the most important gods of the mountain would have been Zeus, Apollo, and Dionysus. The Greek historian Herodotus, writing about a century later, while noting the importance of the Amun temple, commented that the Ethiopians worship Zeus and Dionysus exclusively. Now, that statement is not quite true, but it does support the notion that the Greeks thought of the mountain as being linked to thus to just those two gods. Now, as you can see from this image, Jebel Barkal, which is over here in the top picture, is dry today. Uh, but it lies very close to the riverside forest that lies along the Nile River. In antiquity, the environment was considerably wetter. The rainfall was about 30% or deeper or whatever. Um, and the landscape was more of a savanna than a desert, and the river uh, was a little bit wider. So it's quite likely that the mountain, Jekyll Barco, would have been covered in scrub and hemmed in by forest. As you will see from the photos earlier, as, as you will have seen, um, it has very distinctive steep sides and it dominates the landscape. It's actually one of the largest mountains that is so close to the Nile River. So it lies far from Venetia, but it's near the waters of the Nile and it cannot be reached by ship from Egypt because of the white water rapids to its north. In short, Jebel Barco corresponds exactly to the description of the mountain Nysa in the Homeric hymn to Dionysus. And the description here, while certainly stylized, must have been based on eyewitness reports from the thousands of Greek mercenaries who visited the place and ironically uh, took place in the ransacking, ransacking of its sacred temple. Now let's consider its name. Obviously, from a Greek point of view, Nysa sounds like part of the name Dionysus. Dio means of Zeus. So it's fitting that a god whose name in Greek sounds like Nysa of Zeus should have been born on Nysa. But this name is also significant in the local language. Jebel Barco is the mountain's late Arabic name, but the Kush called it Neswi, the pure mountain. Now, personally, I think Nesui sounds a lot like Nysa, but the linguists and the nerds um, that I've read prefer to derive Greek Nysa from the Egyptian name for the Kush. The Egyptian name for the Kush was Ta-Nahisi. Ta 
is the Egyptian definite article. So this phrase just means the Nahisi. Now, if this phrase sounds familiar to you, it's identical to the first name of the contemporary thinker and writer Ta-Nehisi Coates. So in a roundabout way, Ta-Nehisi Coates and Dionysus have a connection that runs straight through Greek mythology via the Nile. But more to the point, we can say that Greek Nysa comes from the Egyptian name for the Kush. So, Jebel Barkal was where Dionysus was believed to be born, at least according to the Homeric hymn to Dionysus. And we have two early sources that bear further witness to this fact. About a generation after Semeticus's invasion, the Greek poet Anacreon wrote a poem which <coughs> celebrated Dionysus as the child of Ethiopia. About a century later, Herodotus, who famously believed that the Greeks had inherited most of their gods from Egypt, wrote that, quote, the Greeks say that as soon as he was born, Zeus stitched Dionysus into his thigh and conveyed him to Nysa, which lies beyond Egypt in Ethiopia. So if we look in early texts for alternative birthplaces for the god, we don't find any. Um, and so this is pretty good evidence for my thesis, and there's really no uh, evidence to, to contradict it. Dionysus was born on Nysa, near, near what for the Greeks was basically the edge of the world. <clears throat> and whoever composed that hymn believed that this was the truth and also said that people who thought Dionysus was a native to Greek, to the Greek world, were liars. It was from Ethiopia that Dionysus made his way through the Levant and Asia and Thrace before spreading his worship throughout Greece and earning his status as a full Olympian god. So let's explore Dionysus's African connections further. Now, before we do that, it will be useful to review some of the legends which the Egyptians and the Kush related about Os Osiris, who was their equivalent for uh, Dionysus. Um, how do we go back? There we go. So there's no Egyptian or Kushite text which recounts the life of Osiris as a sequential narrative. Uh, so what follows is just a reconstruction. It's based on allusions to the Osiris story that appear in Egyptian sacred writings. So the most important characters in this myth are Osiris, his wife Isis, and Osiris's brother Seth, sometimes called Set. Uh, who is the god of disorder and of all things foreign, unclean, or culturally marginal. A long, long time ago, when Osiris was the ruler of Egypt, he was murdered by Seth in a fit of jealousy. The manner of his death generally involves water. Some versions speak of Osiris being drowned. Others describe Seth cutting him to pieces and so throwing his limbs in the Nile, uh, which then scattered them throughout the country. When Isis learned of this, she went into mourning and set out on a long quest to, rec <coughs> to recover Osiris's limbs. After various adventures, and with the help of some other gods, she collects all the parts and brings them to Anubis, who, as the god of mummification, puts them back together and wraps them up in linen strips. Osiris thus becomes the first mummy. And he's often shown in art wrapped, uh, wrapped in distinctive linen strips, for example, in this image at the top. And you can see that patterning is supposed to represent a pattern of linen strips sort of woven together. But the story doesn't end there. In his reconstituted form, Osiris serves as ruler of the underworld, a kind of Egyptian Hades. And he also becomes a father because his phallus still retains its power. Isis turns into a hawk, copulates with it, and becomes pregnant, giving birth to their son, Horus, who will fight Seth and avenge his father. So notice how Osiris survives his, his dismemberment and he comes back stronger than ever. He's the king of the next world. Kind of, a, a, kind of an Obi-Wan Kenobi figure who transcends the categories of life and death. In later phases of Egyptian religion, this process was sort of democratized so that anybody who went through the appropriate rituals that had once been the prerogative of a pharaoh could hope to live on in comfortable fashion in the land of the dead. 
This story extended its roots uh, throughout the countries of the Nile and provided a meaningful framework for various political, literary, and religious practices. Osiris was especially popular during the time period in question under the pharaohs of the 26th dynasty who sponsored the construction of several new temples to the god. So accordingly, we might expect Greeks residing in Egypt to show some familiarity with it, and such is the case. To work our way into the evidence for that familiarity, uh, let's start with a preliminary question. So why did the Greeks equate Osiris with Dionysus as opposed to Hermes or Zeus or Apollo or one of those guys? Osiris has nothing to do with grapes or wine or merrymaking, which were Dionysus's traditional prerogatives. Uh, the only Egyptian alcohol was beer, and Osiris's story is, is far from a merry tale. And for his part, Dionysus, in his earliest representations, was not lord of the underworld, and he was not the avatar of dead monarchs. So what's the connection? The answer, I suspect, and I haven't really found this question addressed in the literature directly, is that both gods were associated with rowdy public celebrations that involved the phalluses. In Egypt, we know of these festivals from various sources, um, but it's actually the Greek historian Herodotus who describes them in the plainest fashion. The festival of Dionysus, he writes, is observed by the Egyptians much as it is by the Greeks, but in place of the phallus, they have invented the use of puppets, two feet high, moved by strings, the male member nodding in nearly as big as the rest of the body, which are carried about the village by women. A flute player goes ahead, the women follow behind singing of Dionysus. Why the male member is so large and is the only part of the body that moves, there is a sacred legend to explain, a hero's logos. Oswin Murray comments on this passage that the hero's logos probably related to the myth that when Isis was trying to reconstitute the body of Osiris after its dismemberment by Seth, she was unable to find the phallus and used a model instead. Okay. Um, wait, where's my, uh, here we go. Now the Greeks, as Herodotus indicates, had a somewhat similar festival. It involved men and boys dressing up as satyrs, uh, lustful creatures with horsey ears and horse tails, and carrying an enormous model of a phallus, which would be ridden rodeo style at one of Dionysus's many festivals. The Greeks associated the phallus with Dionysus because of the erotic powers of drunkenness, not because of any pre-existing myth. Still, this common cult element was apparently salient enough to motivate an identification of the two gods, Dionysus and Osiris. Apropos of this subject, the, the riddling cryptic philosopher Heraclitus has a comment on the Greek festivals, which has long baffled scholars. Heraclitus wrote, I quote, if people didn't hold a parade for Dionysus and sing hymns to the phallus, that would be a truly obscene act, as opposed to, you know, the phallic festival itself being obscene. Dionysus and Hades are the same, and it is for him that they go mad and celebrate. The identification of Dionysus and Hades has no basis in Greek mythology but it makes perfect sense in terms of the context that we've been looking at. It had been a commonplace among the Greeks that Dionysus really was Osiris. And since in the Egyptian system, Osiris is the king of the dead, this would make Dionysus the same as Hades, the Greek god of the underworld. So Heraclitus is implicitly endorsing that equation here. And he's making clear that Dionysus uh, the Dionysus who was worshiped with phallic parades was closely related to the Egyptian god Osiris. Another sign that it was the, the festivals that the Greeks were looking at when they made this identification rather than say the mythology was that during Egyptian feasts, a figure of Osiris was co conveyed in a boat. Now, it's no coincidence, I think, that as soon as Greek contacts with Egypt begin in earnest, which is, you know, right after 593, we start to see Dionysus associated with a boat. 
in some fragmentary representations, we, we, there, there are images that show satyrs carrying Dionysus on a boat that has a phallus for a prow. I didn't have a good version of that. So the image reproduced here shows Dionysus on a parade float that has no phallus, but it's designed to imitate a ship. And this makes no sense in a Greek context because Dionysus was not a god of the sea and gods don't ride boats in, in Greek mythology. But as an Egyptian borrowing based on the equation of Dionysus and Osiris, it makes quite good sense. All right, so the image on the poster for my talk is, is a rather famous painting of Dionysus, which shows him on board a ship. This was a, in the story this comes from, it was a pirate ship. Some pirates had kidnapped Dionysus who had disguised himself as a boy and they were carrying him off to get some ransom. When the God revealed himself in his true form, all the pirates jumped overboard and were turned into dolphins. And that's what those dolphins are doing there. This, this is a classic representation of the God reveling in his power on board a ship, but it's based on a motif that is Nilotic, that is Egyptian in origin with um, very obvious Egyptian and actually a few Kushite parallels as well. Now, of all the places in the early Greek world that were receptive to Egyptian culture, one of the most important was the island of Samos. The statue of Naeth that I showed you earlier was one of many found on the island at its temple of Hera. Now, about a generation after Semeticus's invasion, the ruler of Samos, a tyrant named Polycrates, established a personal relationship with the new pharaoh of Egypt, a guy named Amasis, and made a small fortune supplying him with mercenaries for his army. But Polycrates goes paranoid, as tyrants tend to do, and cut off his ties with the pharaoh. Polycrates also began to look suspiciously at all the aristocrats on the island, and he frightened a whole lot of them into just leaving town, you know, fearful for their lives. One of the aristocrats that he sent packing was a young man named Pythagoras. Pythagoras had been famous in his youth for an Olympic victory in boxing that he won. His fame didn't protect him, however, so he was driven into exile too. The place he chose to spend the next several years was Egypt, where he had friends at the court of Amasis. There he studied with the priests and sought to learn as much Egyptian wisdom as he could. After spending some time there, Pythagoras was forced to flee once again when, Egyptian, when Egypt was invaded by the Persian Empire. Since Polycrates still held power at home, he decided to make his way westward and eventually settled in the city of Croton in southern Italy. There, he became a very popular lifestyle reformer. Among other things, he taught people that the Egyptian mode of sacrificing animals was the correct one. As the philosopher Isocrates tells us, Pythagoras of Samos went to Egypt and became a student of the Egyptians. He was the first to introduce their philosophy to the Greeks and maintained a particular interest, a very public one, in the details of their rites of sacrifice and temple purification. It was a very early source for Pythagoras's life. Pythagoras taught that when you sacrifice an animal, there are certain organ meats you shouldn't eat, like the heart. We'll come back to that detail later, the heart. He also stressed the importance of physical and ethical purity. And he said that humans would be reincarnated as animals if they were bad in this life, or if they were good, escape the cycle of reincarnation and go to a kind of paradise. Uh, Egyptians did not have a doctrine of reincarnation, but there are shades of the Egyptian eschatology in this uh, sort of creatively reimagined. At Croton, at Croton and elsewhere, Pythagoras taught that when a corpse is buried, it should be wrapped in linen. And linen, of course, was the material from which mummy wrappings were made in Egypt. So things went well for Pythagoras and Croton for a while, but it was a treacherous city, city and eventually a, a coup took place there, uh, led by Pythagoras's enemies. So the philosopher barely escapes with his life, and he re relocates to the neighboring city of Metapontum, where he spends the last two decades of his life. Metapontum is just north of uh, Croton on the map, also in southern uh, Italy. 
there, he becomes a recluse and he's living in the countryside and he starts composing oracles and prophecies and poetry. And he began to write mysterious hymns and wild mythological narratives, which went into circulation under a pseudonym that of Orpheus. So Orpheus was one of several divine singers in Greek mythology, but he was the weirdest by far. You're probably familiar with the story of his failed quest to bring back his wife Eurydice from the realm of the dead. Uh, but his tragedy did not end there. He met his death at the hands of a band of Mynads, female followers of Bacchus, who were stirred to madness by his song. They hacked Orpheus limb from limb and scattered the pieces about the countryside. This is going to be a motif for this talk. Orpheus's head lived on, however, and it continued to sing and to compose verses. The poems that circulated under Orpheus's name and that were actually written by Pythagoras and some of his students were said to have been transcribed from his severed head. And that's what that um, image on the right is showing. The contents of these Orphic poems were just as weird as the circumstances of their composition. Our sources for them, we don't have them in the original, but our sources generally refer to their plots as a heros logos, a, a story that is sacred and is taboo, and it's not to be recited to the public. That's why early classical writers only allude to the poems and rarely go into specifics. Most of our sources for their contents and plots are actually later Christian authors who didn't give a damn about pagan taboos, and it's based on their reports and summaries that we can see that this poetry is full of Egyptian themes. One such poem of which we know was a hymn to Dionysus, which offered a very bizarre account of his life. In this hymn, Dionysus is the child of Semele and born from Zeus's thigh in the traditional way. While he's still an infant, an aging Zeus designates him as king of the world and sends him off to a cave on the island of Crete. A jealous Hera then finds out about the boy and dispatches the Titans to murder him. The Titans, they bribe his bodyguards and enter the throne room where the child god lives. And they distract Dionysus with various toys, including a mirror, including puppets and tufts of wool. When his guard is down, they seize him and tear him limb from limb. And they boil the pieces and they start to roast the flesh on spits. The smell of the burning flesh catches Zeus's attention. He immediately sizes up the situation and takes vengeance, smiting the, the Titans down with a thunderbolt and sending them to Tartarus. Then the god Demeter gathers up the pieces of the infant god all except for her, his heart, which she can't find anywhere. Apollo, the god Apollo, buries the remains of the god near his temple at Delphi. Finally, so we're told, an inconsolable Zeus has a statue of Dionysus made out of plaster. And in the statue, Athena places the heart of Dionysus, which she found somewhere. At that point, our sources go silent. But it would appear that the god Dionysus has been restored to some form of life as a plaster statue with an immortal heart. Now, this, to say the least, is not like any traditional Greek myth. If it is, for example, an unspoken premise of all mainstream Greek myths that gods cannot be chopped up into little pieces, much less killed. So this Orphic myth is clearly a version of the Osiris story. Dionysus is playing the role of Osiris. The Titans are playing the role of Seth. Demeter plays the role of Isis. And Athena acts like Isis's helper uh, in the Egyptian story, a goddess named uh, Nephthys. The heart of Dionysus functions in the story kind of like the phallus of Osiris as the, the seat or the container of the divine life force. Now, as it happens, the only organ that Egyptian embalmers left inside the corpse of a mummy was 
the heart. You thought I was going to say phallus, but actually it's the heart, which was considered to be the dwelling place of the ka or the soul. Mummy cases and funeral masks um, were made of strips of linen coated in plaster. So even though it never mentions Egypt a single time, Pythagoras's Orphic poem was clearly envisioning Dionysus as an Orphic or, uh, Osiris figure who ends up in the end as a kind of mummy. So this hero's logos was ostensibly a myth about Dionysus composed by Orpheus. In reality, it was a Greek adaptation of the myth of Osiris composed by Pythagoras. The historian Herodotus tells us, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is one of the, uh, oh, yeah, this is what I want. The Herodotus tells us, nothing made of wool can be brought into Egyptian temples or buried with corpses. That is forbidden. In this, the Egyptians follow uh, things which are called Orphic and Bach, uh, but which are in truth Egyptian and Pythagorean. There is a sacred discourse, a hero's logos, that speaks to this matter. Uh, the meaning and the significance of these Herodotian lines should be clear by now. The Orphic poems about Dionysus were Egyptian sacred tales imported by Pythagoras. Scholars tend to discount this, however, because A, they deny that Pythagoras could have learned anything in Egypt because, you know, language barrier, all that kind of thing. And B, because they say, Dionysus, he's from Thrace. So all the resemblances to Osiris are like, uh, accidental, this convergent evolution, chance. The cost of overlooking Dionysus's Nilotic roots is that it forces us to reject as fantasy all the obvious Egyptian figures of the texts like the Orphic poems. Perhaps the most impressive evidence for the influence of Egyptian religious practice on early Greek culture can be seen in burial sites that uh, have been uncovered in the countryside of Metapontum, the very place where Pythagoras spent the last decades of his life. And here I'm just going to quote the words uh, from, uh, by Joseph Carter from his book, Discovering the Countryside at Metaponto. So in the Pantanello Necropolis, there's an unusually wide variety of burial containers, practically every type known to the Greeks of Southern Italy, but there's one type for which I have been unable to find exact parallels. These are the inhumations that I have turned plaster lined. The plaster extensively preserved, though often reduced to flat fragments is found mixed with the earth that lay over and around the body. Sometimes the floor of the graves was coated too, but the use of plaster in most cases went beyond this. It adhered to the bones in such a way that the excavators surmised that the flesh had already been removed when the plaster coating was applied. In one instance, at least three coats could be detected over and around the body. The plaster, calcium carbonate, was probably the very same material with which the titans and the initiates in the mysteries were coded. So he makes the connection that I've been referring to, although he, he actually, I think he makes a little mistake in matching it up to details. He thinks it has something to do with the titans rather than the plaster statue. So this sort of burial that we see here didn't catch on, but for about a century after Pythagoras lived at Metapontum, it was the custom there to coat bones and perhaps crucial organs like the heart in plaster as if there were some kind of mummy. And just like the body of Dionysus in the Orphic Hieros Logos hymn, and like the body of Osiris in the Egyptian myth. So here we are. I only have a few more minutes left and I haven't yet said anything yet about late antiquity at this meeting for a group devoted to late antiquity, medieval and early modern themes. And I understand that if I fail to make some connection to late antiquity, I will no longer be eligible for fabulous cash prizes. So let me try to remedy that defect right now. If you wanna stump a classicist, ask them, what's the longest epic to survive from the ancient world? I don't know if professor, any, anybody want to guess? Are you going to, am I allowed to answer? Gonna, you, no, you can get, you can guess. Oh, well, no, you can't answer. No. <laughs> Sowers can't answer. So you might guess 
Homer's Iliad. You might guess the Odyssey. You might guess Virgil's Aeneid. You might guess Ovid's Metamorphoses. Yeah. Yeah, Sauer suggested that. So, of course, he would know. He, he, he probably had to look it up. The answer is a poem called the Dionysiaca, the story of Dionysus, which was composed in Greek in 48 books. 48 books, uh, repeat that, twice as long as the Iliad or the Odyssey. Three globe volumes by a late antique poet named Nonus, who was active around the year 400 Common Era. Yeah. It's a crazy long, brilliantly imaginative ep epic, um, equal parts Homer and Jack Kerouac. Um, there's really no way I can do justice to its plot with so little time, but just suffice to say that it's a poetic biography of Dionysus. Uh, right. Um, one reason it is so long is that it is encyclopedic. So it relates nearly all of the myths and stories that are told about Dionysus at some point in the ancient world. So we hear about Cadmus and Semele, Lycurgus and Pentheus and the Bacchae. We hear about the invention of wine and Dionysus's marriage to Ariadne, even, even the attack of the Titans. We're told about the gods' adventures in Lydia, in Thrace, in Syria, in Phoenicia. And a good half of the epic describes Dionysus' conquest of India. The epic covers nearly every traditional aspect of Dionysus' earthly career, save for one. His links to Ethiopia, Egypt, and the Nile. Egypt is only mentioned, I'm pretty sure, three times in the whole epic, in digressions, devoted to other characters. Now, there's something that makes this omission really, really, really weird, really odd. Nonos himself was Egyptian. He was born and he lived in the city of Panopolis, which is a bit north of Egyptian Thebes. Um, in Nonos's day, Panopolis was like totally Christian and Nonos was himself almost certainly a Christian. Um, his other major poem was A Life of Jesus. Uh, yeah, he was clearly a very learned man who was steeped in ancient polytheistic literature. So how could he write a 48 book long epic about Dionysus and leave Egypt out? So I would argue that this omission is actually indicative of a deep seated Greek cultural habit. From time immemorial, Greek city-states were deeply, deeply divided against each other. The record of wars, plots, hatreds, grudges, massacres, and other forms of discord is long and deep and doesn't bear repeating here. There was never a Greek nation in antiquity, no, never any unity, and efforts by places like Athens to forge a Greek nation always fell apart. The institutions in the Greek world that tended to create harmony and like-mindedness like were always defined by the fact that they were Panhellenic and belonged to no one. So the Olympics are a good example of an institution uh, that managed to transcend local politics and bring together Greeks from all over in a nonviolent forms of competition. The Oracle of Apollo at Delphi was another institution that belonged to no particular Greek city state uh, and thus was revered as a source of infallible truth, right? So your, your neighbors are always wrong, but the, the, the thing that belongs to nobody, that's, that, that's where the good stuff is. That's where the truth is. Now, the god Dionysus began as a local, strictly local god. He was seen as a native son in places like Draconon, Naxos, and Thebes, which were mentioned in the hymn, as the place where the liars said Dionysus was from. But as soon as his birthplace is moved to Africa, Dionysus becomes a Panhellenic favorite, and he's promoted to the rank of Olympian god. Dionysus was never represented in a single piece of Greek, uh, a single piece of art, until about a decade after the Greek mercenary incursion in Cush, about the same time the Homeric hymn to Dionysus that we looked at was composed. Before that, there's no pictures of Dionysus. And then he becomes ubiquitous. Artists and storytellers forged a new consensus that Dionysus was not a local god. In fact, he was a native of Ethiopia, 
So his foreignness was a plus, not a negative. It was actually something that augmented the god's popularity. I think something similar happened with Nonus, but in reverse. Nonus couldn't treat Dionysus as a local Egyptian god because that would be anathema to his militantly Christian peers and neighbors who were very active um, hunting, uh, hunting down heretics and practicing pagans. So he had to move Dionysus away from himself. He had to set him in the remote past and position him out there, abroad, active in places that meant most of his neighbors had, had never been to. As a non-Egyptian figure, Dionysus was totally safe to write about, and that qualification made it possible for the poetic imagination of the poet to indulge itself. So maybe Nonus's choice or omission begins to make a little more sense. For the early Greeks, Dionysus came from Africa. For a later Greek-speaking African, Nonus, Dionysus came from Asia and Greece. This long tradition of Greek city-state hatred and hostility thus made things that were foreign and remote seem all the more attractive, which is a, a feeling that one can sometimes sympathize with today in these not-so-United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thibodeau. You are welcome. <laughs> All right. Any questions?